Hello, and thank you for coming to the Oxford Martin School. Um, just to let you know that this is also being filmed and live webcast, so please bear that in mind when you're asking your questions later. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, who is Professor David Vines, who is the Director of Ethics and Economy, Economics sorry, at the Institute for New Economic Thinking of the Oxford Martin School. He's also the Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics here at the University and a Fellow of Balliol College. Um, and he's here to talk today about his new book, Capital Failure, Restoring the Trust in Financial System. It's very topical. Um, and I am now just going to hand over to David. This is the book that I'll be referring to at, at various stages as we go through the talk. And I'm looking for the pointer right there. And I'm seeing that it does Then I will go that way and that way. Good, excellent. When I'm be beginning, and before I begin, let me just ask, am I clear? Is the microphone working and too loud, too soft, just right? Okay. W when I begin talking about this subject, I always ask people to imagine that life's turned out rather bad for them and they're on their way to a hospital, let's say it's Bristol Hospital, to have a kidney transplant. And kind of half, a bit worrying, halfway there, uh, you say to yourself, oh my God, and I wonder if they're going to whip out one of my kidneys along the way and, and sell it in Singapore. And, uh, 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 and you say, no, 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 they're doctors. Doctors don't do that sort of stuff. And then you say, mm, but Goldman Sachs does. <laughs> that is exactly the abacus trade, which many of you will know about, in which up there in the building, uh, a group of people got together with a reputed fund manager, respected fund manager, uh, and his job was to find the worst subprime assets that he could find in the market that he knew would go down so that Goldman could short them and make money when their price was lower. And lower down in the building were people selling subprime assets to local community finance offices, taking the town savings and investing it for the future. And both of these things, and, and, and they were selling this very package of assets. Now we know that when that came to trial, it was impossible to prosecute Goldman's. And the reason was, they said, caveat emptor. It's not our business to tell people what the stuff is. And if you go to a wheat market, and uh, it's your job to pick up the wheat and see whether it's any good or not. And that defence failed. Uh, that's to say the prosecution failed. Uh, it didn't come to court. They settled out of court on the express requirement that they not admit liability. Uh, and another way of putting this very same point is the thing that I say uh, on the very first page of these slides, and although it doesn't say on the slides, uh, the, the two sentences there, uh, real ones, said to me by someone that we were working with early on in this exercise, who began his professional life working for Morgan Stanley. And he said, I, I joined a firm which was an organisation which helped its clients to do well and earn fees from doing this. And 15 years later, I resigned in disgust from a firm whose business model was looking for people from whom it could make money. And that, just like the joke about the kidney transplant, essentially summarises the whole of this talk. Now, we're still feeling our way on thinking about all of this. Um, it involves, as you'll see, the inter intersection of at least economics, 
philosophy, history, law, and uh, economics, philosophy, history, and law. And as I say this, I realize that I haven't yet given you the first slide. Uh, the, the plan of the talk is to, it has essentially two parts. And these slides were constructed when I was doing uh, this talk with my co-editor of the book, Nicholas Morris. Uh, and he's NM and I'm DV. And we were responsible, essentially, for the two parts of the book. But it's a very definitely a, a collective enterprise, 16 chapters by a range of people across all of those disciplines. Uh, <coughs> What's the problem? Well, my two jokes reveal it, but let's put it another way, that, uh, it, way that it's not normally told in the way of my two jokes. What normally happens is that economists and journalists and others say there's a lot of market failures uh, everywhere. Principal agent problems, conflicts of interest, contracts not properly specified. Uh, and they rise at different levels. We all know there's much stuff about bonuses and remuneration. Uh, there's a lot of concern about corporate governance, which I'll talk to you about. Uh, but also, that's about institutions and uh, contracts with individuals. But there's also difficulties about products. Uh, uh, payment protection insurance, for example. And there is also issues about markets. We all think that the equity market is too short term. And more generally, generically, the creation of risks and externalities. And, 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 and part of the problem about the financial crisis is that there have been 57 books about it, or, uh, saying 57 different causes. And a lot of stuff out there. And this talk and our work attempts to bring some of the uh, considerations together under the framework of the loss of trust. And you'll see what mileage we think we've got from thinking that way. Now, uh, of course, um, people in my subject in economics uh, tend to think that these are market failures and you can fix them with regulation. And somebody it, well trained in the MPhil and economics here, now city, working in the city of London, I suppose making lots of money, came to the talk that I gave on this with Nick Morris at the LSE two or three weeks ago, and systematically interrupted during the talk, saying, what's all this rubbish about ethics and stuff? This is just a market failure, and we know about that. You do regulation. I've had enough of this, I feel like a drink. It, it isn't kind of time over. And, and that's a very real, uh, and you'll see that as we go on, there's a, a, there's a very important tension between that way of looking at things and the way we're going to look at things in this talk. And uh, uh, here's, here's our argument as to why regulation isn't enough, and it's very simple. On Tuesday morning, you introduce a new regulation and there are some very well-paid, very clever, very well-equipped people out there. And by tu Tuesday afternoon, they've worked out how to arbitrage around your new regulation. And you end up, if you're not careful, in that uh, wonderful position that Andy Haldane, the Bank of England, reached in his recent paper called The Dog and the Frisbee. And it's all about, on this first two pages, how uh, calculating the law of motion of a frisbee is really quite difficult and you would certainly need a, a doctorate in physics to, to be a dog to catch a frisbee. Uh, and the analogy is with regulation. It's all quite tough out there and they're all sort of, sort of clever people who are trying to... Uh, the analogy isn't very exact. Clever people trying to arbitrage their reign around you doing, and you need a doctorate squared in financial regulation in order to deal with this. Uh, it's important, but this talk is about an approach that says that's not enough. Let's just zero in on two kinds of bad behavior 
very specifically. Uh, a, a couple of slides ago, uh, I said there's heaps of bad be behavior, but now I'm going to describe two kinds of bad behavior in some detail. The first is about perverse incentives, and the second is about perverse corporate governance. Uh, in the book, there's a wonderful chapter, very clever, by um, Tom No and Peyton Young, uh, now in the business school, Peyton Young, an economist here in Oxford, describing the business model of the representative hedge fund. And the, uh, here's the first aspect of that business model. These guys learn pretty quickly how to do derivatives. And you can find a derivative contract which will go this way 19 times and that way a 20th time. Uh, you know, maybe it's a bet on the weather or something. Proper statistical knowledge of what you're doing. Uh, and you can find such contracts. So, uh, so it's, yeah, such things, time series, which will enable you to write a, co a contract this way and that way, and this, it goes this, the data goes this way 19 times and that way one time, total 20. So you go out into the market saying, I, 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 I've got a contract here. Uh, I want you to pay me five pounds 19 times that whenever it goes this way and I'll give you everything uh, the 20th time when it goes that way. And th please, will you give me a, a derivative of this kind? And when I've collected it, I set up a, a, you know, on the door, David Vines, alpha quality fund manager, please come this way. I always pay 5% above the ruling market rate. I'm very high quality. And this year and next year, you know, people say, he's always doing well, this guy. And you know, isn't this a remarkably good hedge fund? And 20th year comes along, statistically. Sorry, I didn't kind of realize you shut up the door, pull down the sign, go down the road and set up again. What you're doing is disguising fat tails. And th the way I've described it is straight fraud. Uh, Peyton did some statistical work to try and identify from the data whether he could find any hedge funds that could be categorically shown not to be doing this, and he couldn't find any. Now, the, the way I described it is fraud, but you look out there and ask what kind of investments are being made, what do I know about these companies, what do I know about things, and pretty quickly you can see that people who think they're very good are quite often doing something quite like this. The second version of the same story is set in a Japanese nuclear power plant. Uh, the, the it's the, this isn't about the tsunami, it's simply about the five people in the control room. Remember that these people are self-interested and selfish. They have no professional um, morality or sense of obligations whatsoever. And they have a choice in the control room. They can look at the dials and stop the power plant blowing up. Or they can watch Facebook and have fun. And you're trying to write a contract with these people that will induce them not to look at Facebook all the time. Well, that's quite difficult because mainly these power plants don't blow up. And the, the people who work there can do probability theory and they figure out that mainly if they look at Facebook and can't be bothered, it will be all right. And anyway, if it does blow up, they just lose their job and go somewhere else. But the probability of it blowing up because they look at Facebook is so tiny that basically you have to go for these five guys the ownership of the nuclear power plant in order to make the arithmetic work out that it's worth them doing this. You can't write a contract for selfish, self-interested people to take good care. Uh, when they're selfish and self-interested, I said a minute ago, you can't uh, describe a market that will stop them doing fraud on fat tails in the distributions through derivatives. It's not a good story. That's one kind of bad behavior. Another kind is 
uh, about corporate governance. And uh, Colin Mayer has written really interestingly about this. And the best way to understand it is from a conversation that I had with Colin about the uh, Pfizer-AstraZeneca takeover. And we all knew that Pfizer wanted a tax address in England, uh, couldn't care less about uh, uh, the research labs in England, and they signed all these bits of paper about preserving British science. And it was only when it became obvious that this was pretty nearly fraudulent, a bit like the, the takeover of Cadbury's a few years ago, that this was essentially through public and political pressure uh, prevented by a board decision at AstraZeneca. And you will all know that there was very nearly a class action against that board for behaving illegally in not accepting this bid. But, so Collins would be interesting to go and see the fund managers, find out what, and, uh, and so he did. And what they said to him was, it's outrageous what happened. Uh, um, we were part of the people, no, I'm slightly making this up, but it, it, it's essentially true. We were part of the people doing this class action. Uh, Colin said, why? And they said, we wanted the bid premium. This was 30% rise in the share price. It's outrageous we couldn't, get, and Colin said, British science? And they said, what? Uh, now, that's a description of corporate governance. And, 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 and that's a description of the Jensen-Mecklen um, sh uh, shareholder maximization model as applied to finance. And for those of you, not many of you of eco uh, economists, but let, uh, any economists in the room? A, a few, so, so, sort of. Well, the, the Jensen-Mecklen idea of, of shareholder value maximization came out of Harvard in the 60s. And it's very convincing. If you, if, if you assume that all of the things that the firm buys to produce, it buys on competitive markets, essentially spot markets, you go and buy your labour each day and you buy your raw materials and you buy your factory in a competitive market and you sell your products to customers that you don't have any longer term relationships with, a bit like selling wheat at competitive prices. Uh, but there's residual risk in this business, maybe the weather makes your, <laughs> I don't know, productivity goes up and down, but it's risky. Well, in, and, and who bears that risk in this world? It's the shareholders because everything else is just in these competitive markets. They bear the residual risk. So of course it's right that you should try and maximise the value of their holdings because they bear the risk. And these guys got very famous saying this and this w essentially became the, the dominant theory of what uh, board managements ought to do. And Colin just laughs. Uh, and his book is a wonderful exercise in laughter. Uh, b b because if you start right back at the beginning, we all know that the workers who work for these firms uh, have made commitments. And it's actually not a spot market in labour, but it's people who've invested time, energy, careers. Well, the same is true of the providers of the spare parts for whatever they are manufacturing. They've had to invest in their firms in making these things that they produce to sell to this firm. And the same is true of kind of everything that the firm purchases. And it's also true of the things, people to whom they supply the products, long-term relation. Now, you can see that all of these people are bearing risks and they're all having to, uh, ha uh, uh, no, uh, not having to, they all uh, deserve some reward for bearing those risks. Just like Jensen and Mecklen said it should be the shareholders, when everybody's invested their commitments in this firm, they should be rewarded. And that basic model, like the AstraZeneca Pfizer takeover story, is a story where they're not rewarded. That's why it's a, another kind of bad behaviour. Two more examples. Um, Qantas in Australia uh, was nearly taken over by a hedge fund. Uh, what the, the, the deal was that they would sell all the planes and lease them back, uh, sell all the airport terminals and lease them back. 
and we all knew that when something happened, this was 2006, when the financial crisis happened in 2008, there would have been no more Qantas. And would have been, and I've told this story to somebody who promptly, a Chicago fund manager, who promptly said, well, you know, they go bankrupt. You reorganize them on Tuesday, and on Wednesday they're flying again. Why are you worrying? And, and that's a very extraordinary view of what a national airline is. Uh, the same is true of Southern Cross care homes, which were taken over by a, a private equity group, uh, and all the pe people in the uh, in in the uh, operating you know, some middle managers uh, ended up being well enough off to buy a house in the south of France, and all these you know, slightly surprised people who'd been running a rather um, surprising set of care homes suddenly millionaires. Woo. Uh, and then about a year later, um, and, and, uh, because not only did they get it, but the shareholders got, they stripped out the assets, high leverage, and then a year later, the National Health Service really started to put pressure on the fees paid by uh, local authorities for, for, for care of elderly people, and Southern Cross went bankrupt. And, you know, uh, you know, things go bankrupt on Tuesday, and surely that's all right on Wednesday. The care homes are still open. It's the standard reply. And we all know the distress that was caused uh, to the people in those care homes uh, needing care and attention and not quite sure whether in a fortnight they'd be chucked out on the streets because all the... Uh, this isn't very good stuff, is, is what that, that slide is uh, designed to... Um, show. Let me point out that uh, that was almost entirely without reference to things happening over time. This was an almost entirely, what does it say on the, the slide? This is an almost entirely static argument. There's a bit about longer term in this argument. Uh, the the um, British science base is a longer term concern. But then when we go to think about finance, it's really long term. There's an essential finance story is that I, st age 20, start a, a, a saving for my pension. And I, if, if, it's, if I'm not in USS or some deal like that, I need to find a pension provider. My wife did this, and uh, <laughs> the, I would do better if I could remember the name of the famous uh, firm that went bust, but after, yeah, yeah, uh, after 15 years, e equitable life. After 15 years, she had no pension, and it turned out that there was. W I won't go there, but but it's a long-term issue. Now, in long-term issues, um, you need trust. What do I mean by trust? The simplest way of thinking about it is that people keep the promises that they make. Uh, got to be more subtle than that. They've got to be competent enough to keep their promises. Uh, some comp promises are, are kept because you choose not to honour them. Others are promised uh, are not kept because it turns out that you can't. That's why trust is quite tricky. Uh, it, but th there are the words competence and willingness. Um, how economists, you remember uh, the bad behaviour on this previous slide was all about selfish and self-interested individuals and corporate boards. How do economists uh, think about selfish and selfishness in relation to trust? Uh, I haven't made quite clear enough to you all um, that Econ 101 assumes always that everyone is both selfish and self-interested. And that's how we teach our students to think about the world. And you know, what about trust? Well, that's about reputation and repeated gains. How you build a trust when everyone out there is entirely self-interested and selfish is to think, well, you know, if I renege on promises, then I will be someone that in the future will be known as someone who reneges on promises. And if I'm a financial firm, no one invest in my, you know, don't go there. Well, if, if you think 
that that is the basis of trust, then uh, you're a good economist and you're an object of laughter amongst the rest of the social sciences. Because philosophers and political scientists think, and sociologists think that trust is something much deeper than this. And indeed, and so did Adam Smith, that wonderful man who wrote The Wealth of Nations. His other book, which in important ways he thought was more important than The Wealth of Nations, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, begins with the most astonishing sentence. Uh, it's particularly astonishing in the way I'll tell you in a minute. Let me read it to you. Howsoever selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Astonishing in a way I'll explain. What's this about? Well, it's about altruism. It's the simplest idea. But, but it's, it's also less than altruism is approbation. Ask why might I... I'm trying to turn that noun into a verb. But, uh, let me try and put this sentence together properly. My, why might I value the approbation of others for me? Uh, what they are ad admiring is my ability to do things which are useful to them. That's what approbation is. Uh, it's different from esteem. What people, people esteem I, I am an object of esteem when people admire me quite independently of whether what I do is of value to them. And both of those things are stronger than something even weaker, which is doing things which are valuable to other people just because it's a procedure in the community that I belong to or the firm that I belong to that one should act this way, <laughs> not sell kidneys uh, 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 when you're in a, a hospital. He'd <laughs> say, but the, right, our doctors don't do that, I said, but I didn't explain to myself why doctors don't do that. And it might be that actually they couldn't care less about the person under the operating knife. They just don't do that. Uh, now notice Adam Smith, how clever he is. Look at that final part of the sentence, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. As cleverly as ambiguous as you could possibly imagine. Uh, that probably not means not altruism, it probably means approbation. Uh, it might mean a esteem. And so did Al Adam Smith and do these other views re um, uh, rely on anything as soft-hearted as altruism? Quite possibly not. But they require some sense of embeddedness in a community in which what happens for others is of value to me in quite complex ways. What's that got to do with, 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 with what we're talking about. Go back to the economists replying on re re repeated gains and reputation. What I didn't point out was that in the world, uh, as we know, stuff happens. And you write down your repeated gain model and you analyse it and you think about the world that way. Uh, and then an earthquake happens, not in your model. And if you are selfish and s self regarding, and the person on the other side is, well, you end up in the courts because it's not clear what you should do, and it's about time. You know, what's to stop me going the hardest that I can at this? Now, we all know that most things in families and in wider relations, in, 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 in even commercial relations, don't end up in the courts, even when things are grey and difficult. Almost certainly because of these wider considerations that everybody except economists think about really quite seriously. 
Crucially, once you believe that these things matter, the word framing matters. As Adam Smith also said in The Wealth of Nations, it's not from the, I'm slightly misquoting this, but it'll do, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, maker that we obtain our provisions, but from their regard to their self-interest. The same man that said that. That's why the word framing matters. There are some things like selling ice creams where this stuff's pretty unimportant. But there are other things like being a doctor where this stuff is very important. And one of the crucial things that this, actually all I've said in the last quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, ends up to this one idea that is very important how problems are framed. Do you think of them uh, like the economists, like an ice cream seller, or do you think of them in ways in which these other, uh, uh, in which these outcomes for other people matter? Our philosophy colleague uh, has introduced what are useful terms. She talks about weak trust as being what economists do that relies entirely on reputation amongst selfish individuals, and strong trust as relying on these wider, no, th these other regarding motivations of individuals. That's just semantics. It's a, a, a definition of weak and strong, but it's useful to carry those ideas around. And, and here we've got to the point that how you think about a problem no, I've got to be more careful than that. Uh, how the problem is framed can encourage uh, and support strong trust. I'll explain a lot about what I mean by that. Of course, framing is endogenous. One of my students has written a lovely thesis last year uh, just describing, roughly speaking, how when I'm in a community of people who take regard of each other, that's what I do. Why? Well, it's not cl in everyday life, there are many things that it's not quite clear whether I ought to think about them in the manner of being a doctor or in the manner of just selling ice creams. And is this a problem for which I ought to show some moral ob obligation or not? Well, I'm yeah, not sure. Look around. What do other people do? Well, once you think of obligations as being contingent in part on what's happening around you, you have a very interesting theory of what happened in the last 25 years in the financial system, namely that people stopped acting like that and enough people started acting like that, and because that was happening, others followed them, and you ended up over there. Uh, so the, the social process of framing the position that you're at can be very important. Now, where's this left us? It's left us in an interesting position. Mark Carney talking about this, and I think Manoush Shafiq, the new deputy governor of the Bank of England, still think of this as essentially a problem that needs to be solved by policymakers, regulators, lawyers, within the framework of law. But at much the same time as Mark Carney spoke about this uh, issue just before Christmas last year, Justin Welby did as well. And it's a very interesting speech, uh, uh, but it's, it's quite difficult to get a handle on. Is what he said was behaviour in the financial, outra uh, 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 financial system being an outrage. It's just wrong. And, and, and you look carefully at what he means by that, and uh, what he essentially means is, uh, I'm a Christian, and because of that I know it's wrong. And that's not exceptionally helpful for public policy in a secular community. Except that, I think you can regard this idea about other regarding obligations as a way to meet religious concerned people 
I was going to say midway, that's not quite un in the place that they're at. Uh, you can say some of this behaviour was indeed outrageous, and, and, and you're pressed, and you say, what do you mean by that? And I say, I mean it did not show the, the uh, enough concern for the, uh, the outcomes of others of a kind which I think it is appropriate to show. And that's a statement about how, how I think uh, my moral intuitions and those, uh, the intuitions of those in my community should be grounded. And, and then we can walk on both legs together. Um, and, and, and let me tell you just uh, two jokes to show how tricky that is. The first joke is about um, a, a, an after-school child care, care club. Uh, school finishes at half past three and this club shuts at five. The children are there for an hour and a half and, and parents better come and pick them up at five o'clock. Quite a lot of the parents were late, regularly late, annoyingly late. You know, please come, no, late. And so the decision was made uh, they charge the, you know, I'm fed up with this, you pay a, pay a fee for being late. Guess what? The minute that happened, more people, more parents were late. And, and that's a metaphor for a big set of, if you try and deal with a problem in a market-based way, you're in danger of corroding the sense of obligations, not to be late in this case, which you would like to believe are how you're getting a handle on this problem. My second joke is that I was meeting a, a very interesting group of Chinese visitors yesterday and I told this joke to the leader of the group, wonderful man, and he looked at me with a smile and said, those people running the babysitting club did not set a high enough fee. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that, that we will inevitably need to walk on both legs and that walking on both legs is really, really tricky and, and demanding and interesting. So, uh, what do we do? And, uh, and I'm going to be quite deliberately quick about what we do because I think, in a way, setting up the problem is as intriguing as the particular details of what we do. Let's just list the, 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 the four things that we'll do, show you the framework that we have derived from thinking about these things, and then finish with a few examples from other industries. <sighs> Clearly, in, and, 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 and just remember that I'm thinking about culture, but I have in mind that wonderful reply from the visiting Chinese man, that even though I'm thinking about culture, the financial leaning will be important part of the solution. So this matters, even though my concern is culture. And this is sim uh, uh, um, it's absolutely essential to, to remove the symmetry and compensation schemes. So in the, uh, as they say in their paper, uh, when thinking about Facebook and the nuclear power plant, in the army, when you're meant to be on sentry duty, taking good care of whether there are enemies there, and you're found playing Facebook, you just get shot, and, uh, uh, and that's quite, <laughs> quite a bit more serious than losing your job. And that's going on at the minute. Uh, proposals of this kind being very vigorously resisted by pe people in the financial... Do you, do you want to have no directors left in, 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 in the financial sector, is what they're saying. Uh, you can see why they say that. <laughs> uh, and you can see why people want to get it a little bit nearer to being shot, like go to jail or completely remove their pension. Um, but at the, at the board level, there's the... Um, um, imposing liability on directors for doing things that damage the wider community. Uh, and there's, at the f um, institution level, there is also this Dodds-Frank in America, Vickers in this country, removing the subsidy to speculative behaviour by 
r removing the, to the uh, uh, lender of last resort guarantee to institutions that speculate with them. Two sentences. At, until recently, what we've really faced is that bankers take your and my money, put in straightforward deposits, and then take it in and speculate with it. And of course they know, roughly speaking, that they can't go bust because the whole payment system depends on it. So this is just like the asymmetry in the private compensation scheme. It's an asymmetry for the whole institution. Heads I win, tails you bail me out. And the serious e econometric work suggesting that that makes it nearly 100 basis points cheaper to raise money if you're a bank that are in that 1% per year forever, these huge organisations. The Vickers stuff is important for getting rid of that. Secondly, the Colin Mayer response to that bad stuff about corporate governance that I was telling you about is pushing in the direction of trust firms or public interest directors or Swedish model of protecting the firm's mission while rewarding shareholders. And, and that's a, a very significant erosion. What's the word I want? Erosion of the nature of shareholder capitalism, and may be necessary given the problems that we've identified. Possibly partnerships. We all know that Goldman Sachs didn't behave the way it behaves now, when the individual partners' total personal liability was at risk. Uh, went court, you know, and they all said that, that wasn't the issue, we, we just couldn't raise enough capital. But what was the issue was that they lost that death threat of the gun at their heads if the firm went wrong. Uh, and, and this, think of the disappearance of all the building societies. These building societies were simply raided by the large banks to get hold of their deposits. And the, the nation lost its whole nature of the provision of finance in a local, knowledgeable way. So this matters. And, 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 and notice what I'm doing. You know I care about culture. That's what this whole talk's been about. But I'm also talking about these, in, uh, these intricate uh, administrative regulatory things which push, you know, think of the Chinese visitor again, uh, things that look like incentives pushing in the direction of helping the culture do, do better. Um, the central point on this slide is about the erosion of fiduciary duty. And, uh, and, 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 and a way of thinking about that is pretty, cl pretty nearly like the Goldman story. Uh, once upon a time, local authorities invested their money with financial firms who they believed had a duty to advise them well. And right back in the 19th century, uh, a financial advisor, ha uh, 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 no, uh, uh, let me be careful, a, a trustee of a, uh, of, 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 a, of a fund had a fiduciary duty to those that had invested their money with the fund. Um, the, the meaning of that term fiduciary duty was strictly to put the client's interests above all else, including mine. Now, notice all else, including mine. Now you become a big fund manager and you've got a thousand clients. Well, how can that fund manager uh, put your interests ahead of the other 9,900 people that the conflict there? And this fund manager is, after all, a highly capitalised, complicated firm that has to preserve its own profitability. It has interests too. And what's happened to the structure of law is that fiduciary obligations have been almost entirely driven into being contractual obligations. And what a contract does is very different from what a fiduciary duty does. Think about firms at the time of the global financial crisis old ladies' assets invested in very risky outcomes. And everyone looks at the firm and says, you, you, you weren't meant to do that. Uh, to which they 
reply, but I, I just did what the contract said. I had no further obligation. Once upon a time, there would have been a sense of obligation that there is now no longer. Tricky, but important. Um, finally, uh, specific work on culture, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but let me give you an example, again slightly made up, but uh, the, 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 the chief executive of, of someone who'd been the chief executive of a, a, a large Australian successful bank uh, <coughs> said to me uh, um, quite recently, uh, he found it difficult to think of his making his bank into a real uh, all-service global bank. And the reason that he did was roughly like this. Again, I'm slightly exaggerating. He didn't quite say this, but you'll see the point. Uh, down here are people doing routine stuff, current accounts, mortgages, pensions, standard things. And up on the 10th floor, a bunch of turkeys taking high risks and earning a fortune. And we're all in the same firm, all have lunch together in the canteen and whatever. And, and you know what? All the people on the third floor, they come along and see, see, see me and say, you know, please, can I sell payment protection insurance or something? I don't, I don't care how bad it is. I just want to do something that will give me a bonus because those guys are earning a fortune and I need to be like them. Now, that's a story about separation for cultural reasons, that of course we need risk takers, but they should probably be somewhere else. And one of the ways in which the culture of the financial system may need to be protected is by doing this. You, you, many of you, most of you in this audience work in this university. We think that we do different things from entrepreneurs and, and, and get paid differently and have different working conditions. You know, it, having lunch with someone that earns 27 times as much as you and has whatever uh, creates quite complex pr pressures within an institution. Um, um, having said that story, here are some particulars about what you want to do and I'm not going to go into them in, in, in really in much detail at all. There are now firms all really trying to do things about ethics management. And essentially these are about trying to implement changed norms within the institution. Uh, codes of conduct, um, and these codes of conduct need to refer to underlying obligations they're in danger of becoming arbitrary, silly lists, but they're important. Um, and, and the essential way in which they're important is about recognising a wiser set of obligations in the spirit of what I've been talking about in this, in, 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 in this talk. So where does this... So I've now just got two last things to say. Having been through this, it seems to us that an important part of making progress involves four step necessary steps. In each firm, in each institution, it looks as if these four things really matter. Obligations, which I've been talking about a lot. Who, it, who does this firm have an obligation to in what it does? Who's responsible for delivering these obligations? Professional associations, self-regulation codes, ethics management within the firm. Uh, <coughs> and I missed the second thing. Obligations, responsibilities, and mechanisms of delivering these responsibilities. And finally, holding to account for performance, real accountability. And Nora O'Neill, the wonderful philosopher, who gave uh, Reith lectures on trust 10 years ago, uh, argues very strongly that accountability requires an understanding of the purpose of the firm and a, a, 
then an attempt to determine whether this firm is carrying out the purpose that it has publicly de declared it to be doing. You know firms have silly mission statements. This is about doing that seriously and then holding the firm to account in a serious way for doing what its mission statement says. Now, uh, there are, and this is my last slide, and the purpose of this slide is to show that it can be done. Uh, finance looks really difficult to turn around. But so uh, law and medicine, we know, have schools, Hippocratic Oath, legal uh, uh, obligations to, pay to clients, and uh, peer review. But rather interestingly, the, the nuclear industry had Three Mile Island. And almost nothing like that has happened since. And it's a, because there's a very strong self-regulatory cultural a, 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 a safety system in the nuclear industry. The, the chemical industry had Bhopal blow up in India, killing thousands and thousands of people and, 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 uh, and damaging the health of many tens of thousands of others. Nothing much has, like that has happened since. There's a very, very strict self-regulation within the industry. And this involves doing things that financiers hate, like banning certain ways of doing things. No, you know, arms in the air, you ban products, are you kidding? Other industries do this. Um, clothing is very simple, child labour, but it's the Gap and, uh, and firms in our uh, in, in, in our that sell to our mainstream markets now don't do child labour where they get their, 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 their garments from, and that's consumer pressure. Uh, advertising, uh, talk about forestry, can talk about the last thing I'll talk about is the diamond industry, uh, no, the diamond market in New York, because it's so intriguing. This market is run exclusively by the Jewish community. Uh, the issue is difficult. Diamonds are very small, extremely easy to steal, and also it's very easy to pass off blood diamonds as ones obtained legitimately. You can't tell looking at it. How do you know that that's not happening? Tricky. How is this market administered by this tight-knit community and anybody who makes mistakes simply faces his name on the wall in the communal meeting room, and they're essentially expelled from the community. And this feels quite like what the City of London used to feel like in finance. And that's, in a way, the place to end. It can be done. Uh, there's a lot to do, uh, and it's a challenge. But I think, I, certainly my sense, that the Bank of England and all the regulatory authorities in this country are now set on this task, you will know that Richard Lambert uh, advised on the setting up of a Banking Standards Council. Uh, the, they've just appointed their chief executive. There's a lot of work going on on the subject. Thank you. Um, so we've got um, time for a few questions and there is a drinks reception afterwards which um, David will be at so you can ask him um, questions there as well. So I'm, I'm going to bring the microphone round. So I'll start with this gentleman as he already has his hands up. Thanks very much. You don't talk about why this bad behaviour started. There was a time when there didn't exist and then there was a time when there was. I think the problem is that it's not possible to make an honest living in finance today. <laughs> and the reason is because money manager capitalism is just too large. Yeah. There's too much financialization. Yeah. The ratio of uh, credit to the real economy is too large. There's nothing to invest in except for criminal and fraudulent activity. And that won't stop, and, and the continual bailouts by our governments won't stop, I would argue, until the financial sector is let's say, the size it was in the 1970s. So you can say all this as much as you want to these people, but they have to earn a living, and the only way they can do it is by ripping us off and 
getting their lads from the central government. That's, that's a sad testimony. Is it, l l uh, let me just say one thing in response to that. In 1970, my parents couldn't borrow enough money to buy a house. They bought our family home only because they had a wealthy friend who lent them the money. Um, so I don't think we can go back there. Uh, so our task is, is unfortunately to... Tr uh, but let me go to the other end and say there's, it, there's clear there was much too much finance in the run-up to the crisis, doing stuff which Adair Turner wonderfully said did no social purpose to this activity whatsoever. There's a bunch of rubbish out there. Uh, but the provision of finance in a world which needs not just mortgages, but pensions and education. Uh, that's, you know, before you put to one side entrepreneurial fun and games in going out west and building some fancy thing and making a fortune, which people like that need financing too, but we can think about that out there. But straightforward world now needs much more financial support than it did. 40 years ago for these three reasons. And, and we've got to find, I think, a way of doing these three things much more safely. And, and, and so I would respond to what you're saying by the, the point I made in the middle of the talk, separation between fun and games and straightforwardness. And straightforwardness is, is pretty, it's kind of like supplying electricity. And, and you you don't earn a fortune to go and supply electricity. Uh, it, it's kind of straightforward, and uh, uh, that's how r regular banking and regular finance is. Uh, it, 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 and, and here's a way of making that point another way. When the dot-com crash happened 10 years ago, for about three weeks we thought this would destroy the universe. And it turned out not to be very damaging. And the, realize that the, the, the reason was that the dot-com crash was out there in the equity market, in a market where people had expected to bear risks and bad luck, sorry, <laughs> risk came, they bore them. And what has gone wrong in the last 15 years in finance is precisely what you describe in that regular banking and finance and provision of straightforward stuff has got tangled up with things very like what was going on in the dot-com boom. And a lot of that will, I, I believe, deal with quite a lot of what you've described. And, 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 and the bottom line is, I would say it has to, because finance is much more finance is necessary than used to be. Yes, Please. thank you. I have a question. Um, I understand a, a very high proportion of the surplus earned by in financial services is actually paid out as bonuses. Yes. I thought about two thirds or more. Yeah. An extraordinarily high amount when you think about what goes on in other sectors. Yeah. Now, much of the rest is now going out in fines. Every <laughs> week we hear about huge fines. And if we read the FT, it's a yeah. ticking bomb because yeah. you know, the legal suits are building up. Now, where are the shareholders in all this? Because the shareholders of banks include some people who are as sophisticated as yeah. the bankers themselves. Yeah. And yet, they are content to let this situation go on, which uh, is quite extraordinary to any uh, object uh, to observe. And, uh, it's a very real question. Here's my understanding of how to think about this. Um, I think in, in it, many people in finance are not really employees at all. They're, they're um, independent consultants who happen to work for Morgan Stanley. And, and here's my description of the, of the business activity of the, of the best pits of Morgan Stanley to work for, or whatever, I'm, I don't mean specifically them. Uh, your job is doing deals, and you spend uh, about six weeks putting together the really complex deal. You know, it's difficult getting... I met a Chicago banker 10 days ago who talking to me about a, a billion dollar hotel deal that he'd done. You know, it's quite hard to do that. If you're doing 
one of those inside these large financial firms. You're basically s sitting in the firm, you're, you're the insurer that, bri no, th I meant insurer, p the person who, you know, you know what I mean in language, you are the person that makes it happen between that person and that person. And you get a fee from, for it. And it's quite complicated. And it closes, this deal closes at five o'clock this afternoon. And you go to your manager one up at midday, you have lunch with him, and, and you say, you know, it's all going to close at five. I have to tell you, I've got a phone call placed at three o'clock this afternoon that would screw up this whole deal. Now can we talk about my pay package? And I think that's basically the way that business works. And that you ask, how is it that some number, I, 30, 40, 50% of the surplus is expropriated by those who work within the firm. Well, if you were running a, uh, uh, if you were running a firm in which everybody in this room was, I was the CEO, and ev you know, everyone had <laughs> lunch with you and lunch tomorrow with you and all these lunches in which I'm giving away money in response to this bribery, uh, it's quite hard to stop the stuff spilling out. Um, and, and so the remuneration committees in these, f you know, I've, I've overplayed that argument, but you can see what I'm getting at. And the remuneration committees in these institutions have a really difficult job. And they, they, you know, I sit on your remuneration committee and you sit on, you know, all do this. So it's the going deal. Uh, one proposal I've heard, which I think is interesting, is that every deal should be managed by two people. So that when the lunchtime comes, I can't do that because <laughs> my, my colleague will close the deal this afternoon if I'm trying to pull this fast one. And some way of holding down remuneration in this way seems to me to be at the core of, of, of the task. Okay, Please. we've got time for one more question and the lady at the front. Thank you. Um, I, I do feel you are very optimistic yes. about this situation. I know you listed all those other areas where it was all okay. Well, quite frankly, a lot of us think the chemical companies are pretty bad. Monsanto yeah. and all those people, we could do a lot of reforms yes. there. To, and yeah, yeah, yes. And it is something about ethics, and I think that it, this really has changed. I mean, when I was a student, an economics student, PPE student in this university, nobody taught us that everything was about self-interest, and so it was about your public duty to, you know, you were being educated to do something to help society to become better and to work properly. And there's something gone very wrong that this is now taught the other way around. And then, of course, you're working, you know, you go and work with other people who are holding those same views because they've been educated in the same <laughs> institutions. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of last uh, uh, dinosaur I feel very the cross last generation. about this. I think that and, there's and some know, truth in that. We know what happens to whistleblowers. You know, whistleblowers, the people who dare to speak up, you know, they get mm. punished very badly. They'll never be employed again by anybody. <laughs> there's a, this whole culture is yeah. really... Um, completely corrupt. But there is also something about the size of it. We can't go mm, back to how it was your, in the 70s because it's, you know, we've now got these huge corporations instead of, you know, lots of good small businesses. Can we not insist that we have small businesses and that we go back to stopping monopolies and we go, go back to having proper trust, you know, so that then people will be working together in a more they'll know each other and they will perhaps behave in a more kind of self, I mean, other regarding way. I, I mean, there are lots of questions here. She's I trying to grab the building away from me. Uh, I, I think that, uh, l let me say two things about that. That sense of, of, uh, of um, social purpose as being a kind of last generation thing, I think is remarkably true that the, uh, certainly in my own subject, the sense of what it is to be an economist uh, has changed. Uh, and um, 
there's a very interesting story to be told about that. And it's got a lot to do with the rise of finance and the rise of a genuine, in, genuine in intellectual interest in how the financial system works amongst economists, which has turned uh, in, in ways which you know, we take a long time to talk about, from a genuine interest in how it works into willing supporter of. And I think it's, it's uh, a very clear sense that my, my profession has become a willing supporter of whatever the financial system does. Uh, not s there are a lot of people since the crisis who've stopped to think. Uh, but before the crisis, I think that description is a fair one. And it's partly an intellectual mistake tangled up with an ideology, uh, the, the two very big things. Let me try and say what I mean. Uh, so let's go Ed Balls. Ed Balls did light touch regulation. It's not because he had a bunch of friends uh, in the city. It's because he genuinely believed that the provision of financial services with light touch regulation would do well. And why did he believe this? essentially because the economics profession told him that. And the economics profession came to believe that because... Uh, now, a cynical way is to say because they found fascinating ways to have fun doing models of markets that work well. Uh, that cynical remark is partly true. But partly they realised that it was the case that clever financial uh, work could be helpful. Sometimes yes and sometimes no. And the understanding of when yes and when no is something that the economics profession is only really now beginning to get the equipment to do. That's the first thing. The second thing to say is about size and it relates to the earlier question. I, I think for straightforward financial services there's everything to be said for uh, small is beautiful, for want of a slogan. Uh, and I notice that this is one of the things that, that Archbishop uh, Justin Welby and, the, uh, and, the, and the, the Anglican Church have been attempting to do, is, is try and lead the setting up of local small-scale banking institutions. We all remember that the bank manager was once an imported trusted provider of advice that was fiduciary duty comes to mind. That's to say of someone who you could believe was giving you advice which was not connected in any way with his own interest but was both knowledgeable and dispassionate. And that's in important ways a community thing. And since straightforward banking is straightforward, there is a not to be said for these moves, and I believe, you, you call me an optimist, I believe that this is going to happen. Uh, l less of an optimist, and uh, uh, I, I certainly be believe it should happen. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so it just remains for me to say that um, there is a drinks reception next door and you are all welcome and Professor Vines will also be at the drinks reception so you may ask him any other questions. And this is available in, in, bookshop, in, in bookshops. We were to have Blackwell yeah, coming Yeah, unfortunately, here. Um, due to staff sickness, Blackwell's couldn't come over to sell the book. But um, Blackwell's is open to 7pm, so if you run across the road, grab a book, <laughs> um, Professor Vines will be able to sign one for you. My porter will let you back in the boarding out building I own and sure that. <laughs> but otherwise, please join me thank to you thank you, Professor Vines, Terrific. for such a fabulous <laughs>